Hi everyone, my name is Logan Jacqueline. I will be leading, um, I'll be hosting our webinar tonight. Thank you for attending Case Western Reserve University's Master of Science and Anesthesia program. Tonight's topic will be preparing your CASA application. So here's our agenda for tonight. Um, we have Ty Townsend with us today. He is the program director for Austin, and he will go over the profession and program overview. Um, the majority of our time will be spent on the application process, which will be led by Teresa Sapanik, who is our admission specialist. And then we'll wrap up with a Q&A. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ty to talk about what is a certified anesthesiologist assistant. Great. Thank you, Logan. Everyone, uh, thank you for being here this evening and appreciate you participating in the webinar. My name is Ty Townsend. I am a certified anesthesiologist assistant and also the program director for the Case Western MSA program in Austin, Texas. So to start with a little bit, let's uh, share a little bit about what is a certified anesthesiologist assistant. We are advanced practice professionals uh, with extensive education and training in the delivery of anesthesia. We work within the anesthesia care team alongside uh, the physician anesthesiologist, and we are involved in uh, preoperative evaluations, creating and implementing anesthesia care plans, and being involved with the anesthetic delivery and care of our patients from the preoperative through the intraoperative, as well as in the recovery phases as well. Um, so that uh, summarizes that we care for patients through the, all the stages of the operative setting. Uh, we are certified by the National Commission for Certification of Anesthesiologist Assistants, the NCCAA. That is who will administer our uh, certification exam upon successfully completing the program of study through any of the MSA programs. And the NCCAA works closely in collaboration with the uh, Psychological Services Incorporated to establish and validate our board exams. There are currently 22 jurisdictions where certified anesthesiologists practice. Um, Nevada, uh, I am happy to share with all of you, just passed licensure um, last week. So that is the newest state on the map to have uh, licensure for anesthesiologist assistance. Um, most recently, uh, Pennsylvania and Utah have come on board. and. Um, expanded our practice opportunities. We are recognized nationally uh, within the Veterans Affairs hospitals. And you'll notice on the map that a majority of those states are a dark blue, and there are a few states that are the light blue. That just differentiates the difference between how the delegation of anesthesia services provided by AAs are um, or overseen. So you have licensure as well as delegatory authority. So the states in, in the light blue color, um, the, the roles of the anesthesiologist assistant can be, <clears throat> excuse me, delegated by an anesthesiologist uh, and allows them to practice under that model in those states without having to go through the um, licensing boards for the various states, which could be, um, and most often, the medical boards for those institutions or for those states. So. Graduate outcomes, clearly AAs are in high demand. Um, as a program director, uh, I often have uh, employers speaking with our students, uh, definitely during their first, first semester of training. Uh, as they start trying to recruit and get individuals that would be interested. Uh, the Case Western Reserve University MSA program has uh, nearly 100% job placement as well as 100% uh, certifying exam pass rates. Uh, starting salaries uh, continue to rise um, with uh, the average being almost 190,000 uh, per year. There are some locations where salaries are well over 200,000. Um, and that uh, is uh, 
doesn't include the benefits. Um, a lot of places will offer overtime pay, um, call pay initiatives, and then as well as sign on bonuses. Um, on here, we're talking about um, overtime averages are about 24,000. Sign on bonuses average about 40,000. There are some um, online job job postings that push that up to uh, oh there you go you cut out a little bit thank you a majority of our um, case western alumni um, are able to pay off their graduate school debt uh, within the first 10 years after practicing one thing that being a certified anesthesiologist assistant offers is, is a great work-life balance. Uh, most locations uh, are gonna have flexible 40-hour work weeks. Anesthesia is not a nine to five profession. Uh, individuals are needing uh, the services you provide on a 24 seven basis. And so hospitals work towards making sure that they have those uh, staffing models available to provide AAs with a, a model that is flexible with their own, with their, um, with their life, as well as the needs of the hospital. It's not uncommon for institutions to be offering um, eight hour shifts, 10 hour shifts, 12 hour shifts. Some individuals may work uh, 16 hour shifts. Some of them may work uh, evenings or nights or weekends only. So it provides an awful lot of uh, flexibility and opportunity to work the hours that are going to uh, be best for you and for your family. Um, with uh, some of those institutions will also give practitioners the opportunity to take call. Um, some institutions might have that factored into their salaries. Others might provide extra compensation for taking call shifts meaning that if you wanted to make additional in income, you all you have to do is sign up for additional call shifts. And uh, those the, during those periods where you might uh, be on vacation or not have a need for extra income, then you would have the opportunity of giving your calls away to those that are interested. On average, most institutions, uh, facilities are gonna be offering about six weeks of uh, paid time off. Uh, and then that can be, and then you will also uh, often receive uh, time set aside for um, your continuing medical education as well to attend conferences uh, in order to maintain your uh, certification. Case Western Reserve University is one of the um, first AA programs. Uh, it has been in existence for well over 50 years. Uh, we have expanded our educational opportunities beyond Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, approximately 12 years ago, we opened up a training facility in Houston, Texas. Shortly after that, around 10 or 11 years ago, we began training anesthesiologist assistants in the Washington, D.C. area. And then most recently, last year, we launched the Austin campus. All the Case Western Reserve University MSA programs are 24 months in length. We do begin uh, at the beginning of summer semester. So usually it is the last week in May, first week in June when we begin. Our programs has an emphasis on uh, three areas of training. It's gonna be on didactic instruction, simulation, and one of the things I think that makes Case Western unique uh, in the uh, AA training realm is our early hands-on clinical training. So right now uh, here in Austin, our first year students are in their uh, fourth week of training and they are already spending time in the operating room. Uh, all my students were, were in the operating room this morning uh, doing machine checks and uh, tabletop setups and learning how to, how to get things prepared in the operating room in order to provide anesthesia services. Uh, during your first year of training, that is going to be, um, you will have the early hands-on clinical exposure 
but we are going to focus on the didactic side of things. So during the first year, uh, I equate it to about 78% of your training is going to be didactic in order to understand the science uh, and various theories of anesthesia administration. We will incorporate that with some simulation, which is the only, the only time we have to press the pause button. There is no pause button when you're in the operating room working on patients, but in simulation, we can slow things down a little bit. We can, we can pause the simulation to further expand and elaborate on different ideas and thoughts. Case Western also has a faculty student mentorship program uh, where the, thank you, the way I'm providing uh, more direct uh, contact and interaction with the faculty. Out of, uh, within those 24 months of training, uh, our graduates complete on average around 2,100 clinical hours, and that is direct patient care hours. That's, that's a little separate than, a little different than just actually being in the operating room. Um, and all of our programs are accredited by the uh, Commission on Accreditation of Allied Health Education. All right, thanks so much, Ty. I'll turn it over to Teresa. Thanks, Logan. Thanks, Ty, for all that information. It's always good to hear that. All right, so for admissions requirements, again, my name is Teresa Sapanik. I'm an admissions specialist with the program. Um, I work for the network located in Cleveland. Uh, if you've emailed any questions, they've probably been routed to me at some point in time. So what I've done is I've dropped three links in the chat. Uh, Logan forwarded to us um, your questions, and there are a lot of great questions to start. I'm going to be going over some of those questions in detail towards the end. There are there were a lot of questions, though, that could have been answered or can be answered if you uh, go through those admissions pages, especially the FAQ. We're constantly updating those pages, rewording, making sure things are clear. Um, so hopefully today between me answering some of your questions and those links that were posted there, we will hit most of your answers. If there's anything specific to you that really probably wouldn't have much to do for the group as a whole, please email the program directly with your question and it will get routed to the correct person. And that email will be given to you at the end of this presentation. So getting back to the PowerPoint our admissions requirements. We require four main things. So um, bachelor's degree, and that has to be a bachelor's degree from an accredited college in the United States, a US territory, or Canada. If you have a bachelor's degree internationally, you'll have to get um, an evaluation form and submit that with your application. The prerequisite courses, I will go over those on the next slide. Um, but if you've done a pre-med track, You've probably had all of these courses already. The third thing that we require is an admissions test, and that can be the GRE or the MCAT. It does not matter which one that you take. Our standard answer is whichever one you can have, score higher on. All of our uh, incoming class averages can be found on the website. So again, those are averages. So as long as you're close in that ballpark, you're good. The fourth thing that we require, and someone did ask this ahead of time, do I have to take CASPER? Yes, that's one of our admissions requirements. So your application is considered incomplete if you do not have the CASPER test taken. Okay, so our admissions course, or prerequisites, I'm sorry, um, the courses, as you can see, they are pretty similar, if not the same as what most med schools require. And these are in semesters. If you've taken classes in quarters, it just depends on the credit hours. Um, some of the quarter schools in California will have three courses in a series instead of a standard two for semesters. So that just depends on how your school does it. But we require one semester of biochemistry. Biochemistry at community colleges typically is not strong enough for us to accept. So you'll have to take biochemistry at a four-year college. Um, we require two semesters of general biology with lab. We require one semester of a human anatomy with lab, one semester of human physiology with lab. 
Now, there's one thing I want to say about these two courses, the human anatomy and human physiology. You are able to take a human anatomy and physiology with lab course from a community college. That's the only two classes that we will combine. The next on the list would be general chem with labs, one year of that, two semesters. One semester of OCHEM with lab, one year of physics with lab. So that's two semesters. Then there's calculus. Um, it can't be pre-calc. It can't be a survey of calculus. It has to be a Calc 1 course. Advanced stats, that's the most uh, questions that we get. We've actually have a spreadsheet. So if you are unsure, you have to take a stats class still. Um, we have a lot of data from stats classes from different schools. So just email the program with your information. Where did you take it? Where do you want to take it? Give us the course name and number, and we can check that for you. Um, again, like biochemistry, most community colleges will not offer a statistics at an advanced enough level um, for us to accept. And then English with expository writing. That's basically just your intro uh, English class that you take when you get to college. All right, so next we're going to get into creating an account with CASA, which is what the whole point of us being here is today. So on our um, main page, there is a link for you to start an application. And when you click on that link, it gets you to this page. So you'll create an account if you haven't already done so. Pretty simple. You want to go to the next one, Logan. Then you're going to choose your case program. Now, there are a couple deadlines that you have to keep in mind. There's our October 1 early decision deadline. And then there's our February 1 regular admissions deadline. So if you, as long as you apply and you're complete by October 1, you're considered early decision. If you, um, someone asked earlier, uh, one of the questions was, if I apply now and I don't want to be considered until regular decision, um, as soon as you apply, you're automatically considered. It's just by the date. Uh, we don't sort things out by any other criteria other than that October 1 date and the February 1 date. What's unique about CASES program um, is that when you apply for one application uh, price, you are actually applying to four different locations. So CASE only has one application. And when you do that, you're going to apply to Cleveland, to Houston, to Austin, and to Washington, DC. You get to choose within the application, rank your preferences, one through four. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, next is our uh, application fee. Kind of, I've mentioned it already. You'll pay one application fee and you'll be applying to all four locations when you do so. On the application dashboard, it's gonna look like this. And uh, there's four little tiles on there. And what's nice about this is that you could start one section and if you get bored with it or if you're missing materials, you, you can go back, it saves automatically. You can come back to this page and then maybe enter your academic history or start putting your supporting information. So CASO is actually really pretty simple. Um, your personal information is next in there. A lot of that information is just for statistical use within the program. Um, none of this is going to have any sort of bearing on whether or not you get accepted to the program. Next is the academic history. And this is where you're going to put in what colleges that you attended. You're going to enter your transcripts as um, CASA requires and then enter your standardized test. That means either the MCAT or the GRE. Uh, it's very important to follow directions and how to enter the information in CASA. They're very specific about it. Um, if you take the GRE, um, I know some people will take it and then they'll enter their unofficial scores at, while they're waiting for their official scores to come in. That's great because we could get a jump start on evaluating, evaluating your application. Right now, I have a lot of applications that are just sitting because it's okay that you submit your application without scores, but we can't evaluate it. Maybe some people submitted their application, but they're not taking the GRE until 
July or August or September. You're going to have them in by that early decision deadline, but just know that you're probably not going to hear from anyone until we hear we get those scores. Um, did I miss anything on there? I don't think so. No. All right. So supporting information. Um, the, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later. We had a lot of questions about evaluations. So you'll enter, um, there, there'll be a place there for you to ask your evaluators to um, submit a form for you. A lot of evaluators um, upload a letter as well. You'll enter your experiences, your achievements, any license or certification that you might have. Um, and this is where your essay will be. So we want to look for um, well-rounded individuals here. We want an essay that really speaks to who you are. I'll talk a little more about that later, but the essay is a big one too. That's your personal statement. That's gonna explain you outside of what you look like on paper. So that's um, important. But the more personal it is, um, I think the better for the admissions community, committee to get a good picture of who you really are. Um, next section is going to be program materials. And that just means materials that we have requested that CASA has for us specifically, our program. And there's more on the next slide for that. So if you look at this program materials homepage across, well, it's kind of the middle of the slide, but there's the home tab, there's questions, there's documents, and then there's prerequisites. So the home tab is going to give some information that is specific to our program that makes sure that you read. It gives you little tips and tricks there to, to understand what we are looking for. And it is specific to our program. So when you go in, if you apply to other programs, it's not going to look the same. Each school is going to be a little bit different. There are some questions that we're going to ask you there, and that's where you're going to rank your locations. Do you want Cleveland first? Do you want Houston first? Who do you want second? Who do you want third or fourth? The documents upload would be things like AP scores or extra letters of recommendation. I want to give you a little tip for the documents. Some people get really stressed out because they have information that they want to upload there, and it only gives you so many uploads. If you combine all of your information into one PDF and upload it there, it counts as one document that you upload. So it gives yourself a little bit of a buffer. And then the last section is very important. That's where you do your prerequisite matchup. That's where you look at our prerequisites and you say, I've taken that and it's here. I've taken biology one with lab. It is University of Georgia, I took it in spring, blah, 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 and this was my grade. So that kind of helps us look at your transcripts, look at how you think you match up, and uh, get through the applications a little bit more quickly. All right, if you have any trouble with CASA, if you're trying to upload something and it doesn't work, or you think you should have another document upload, or you can't figure out why your application isn't verified. It's complete, but it's not verified. You have to ask CASA. We can't do anything about that. We just use them uh, as our uh, application portal. So this, this information that is on this slide is also on our website, and it is also within the application. All right, so get into these Q and A's. I have a lot of them, Logan. All right. Oh, are you? Um, yeah, let me get a drink of water real quick. Okay. Are you going to answer the pre-submitted first? Mm -hmm. All right. Perfect. So hopefully we won't answer. I haven't even looked at the Q and A. Are there a lot? Holy moly! Yeah, there are. All right. Let me get one more drink. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask. I'm going to look at some of these specific CASA questions. Someone said, I have a question about the application website. I was wondering why am I unable to select many of the schools available on the CASA application? And this kind of goes with the tech, tech problem. 
because currently all of the um, anesthesiologist assistant program applications are open and they are available to select. But once a deadline for a program has passed, you're now no longer going to be able to submit an application. So most likely in your case, you're probably just going to have to contact CASA to find out what's going on. Um, someone asked, how do I update schools on future activities such as shadowing? Um, can, you, can I add, edit an application after the fact? And so the answer to that is mostly no, you can't edit an application after the, flat, after the fact. You can submit your application before your transcripts and evaluations are received. So when you're in the academic update, that time period allows you to update planned or in-progress coursework that you've completed since your application was originally verified. So we recommend that you update your application if you need to during the academic update window and also request that any official transcripts be sent to CASA for any new prerequisite coursework that has been completed since submitting your application. And that's important because if you submitted your application, you're taking summer classes, you want to get your updated information in there as soon as they're available on an official um, transcript. A um, couple questions about, are there any secondary essays after the primary application is submitted? And the answer to that is no. There's no supplemental application or secondary essays. Um, someone asked, what are some of the extra requirements on this application that, that I should be aware that may take extra time? There are no extra requirements so, and there's no supplemental application. And there are two mandatory document uploads, which are the resume and your shadowing document. And I'll get to that in a sec. Um, and the last CASA question is how to best enter the total hours for the extracurricular section? Is it better to give an example and tell a story or make it sound similar to what would be on a resume? And the answer to that is the section of the application is essentially a built-in resume. So you want to enter information as you would on a resume. And the resume is a mandatory, mandatory upload for a program. So although we require a resume, we still want you to complete the built-in resume on the application because both are helpful to our admission committee. Okay, let me see where we wanna go here. Let's go to, um, I'm gonna come back to prerequisites. I'm gonna circle back to that in a second, but I really wanna take the time to hit um, some questions, a lot of questions that people had about strengthening their application. That is a real popular um, topic. So what are some things other than GPA, shadowing experience, and test scores that make a student stand out? And here's our answer for that. The first things we look at are overall GPA, the prerequisite GPA, and admission test scores. If those are competitive, we will invite the applicant to interview. During the interview, we look at the applicant holistically and take everything into consideration letters of recommendation and evaluations, clinical or medical experience, communication skills, maturity, knowledge and understanding of the profession and the potential to succeed in the program. Um, what are some key aspects that make an application stand out? That was another question. Strong academics, a good interview, high degree of professionalism, and good understanding of the profession. Um, I think that might be it for those for right now. If you actually, anyone who's on um, the webinar has gone to the admission requirements link. I'm gonna go through those admission requirements in a little more detail since we have some time. And I'm going to talk and hit some popular questions that we get. So I'm not going to talk too much about the bachelor's degree. I've already done that. You need a bachelor's degree from an accredited college, university, U.S., U.S. territory, or Canada. The prerequisite courses, if you have taken them outside of the United States, 
a US territory or Canada, we cannot accept them. Prerequisites must be taken at a US school, US territory, or a Canadian school. Prerequisites must be taken in person unless those courses were moved online during COVID, during 2021 and 21, 22 academic years. And I'm down to the notes on prerequisites if you're following me there. We do have time limits for our prerequisites. We have three key prerequisites, biochemistry, human anatomy with lab, and human physiology. Those have to be taken within five years of the application deadline. Our five year for this um, application cycle is anything from 2018 forward. So if you've taken those classes, 2018, 19, 20, you get the picture, we will accept them. All other prerequisites outside of those three have to be taken within seven years of the deadline. And that is 2016 forward. So if you've taken those, the rest of the prerequisites 2016 forward, we will accept them. If you do not meet the prerequisite time limits, you have two options. The options are to retake the prerequisites or to take the MCAT and score a 500 or better. Those are the only two ways to um, waive the time limits on our prerequisites. Um, the next question I get a lot is, can I take courses while I apply? For example, some people are applying now and they're taking classes this summer. That's fine. You could take them in the fall. You could take them in the spring. They just have to be completed by the time our program starts, which is always the end of May. So if you are applying this cycle for a May 2024 start, courses, all prerequisites have to be completed by the end of May. Um, AP credit, we accept AP credit. Someone did ask a question about AP credit. We, the university, Case Western, uh, accepts scores of four or five. So if you have AP credit that you wanna use and you scored a four or five, we will need your AP score report and we will need your high school transcript submitted with your application. A lot of times AP scores are archived. So just know that it's gonna take a little bit extra time to get those and plan for that. Um, the last thing is proof of labs. If you don't have anything in your transcript that specifically says my biology one class was taken with a lab, you have to submit a screenshot or something that describes um, your course saying that a lab was part of that course. Um, the next thing is admission tests. On our admissions requirements page that I'm on right now, we have our incoming students averages. So for our program, our MCAT average was a 502. Again, that's an average. So there's a range within, built within that. Um, the prerequisite or science GPA uh, average was a 365, 366 for their overall GPA. Uh, GRE is about the 60th percentile or better in all three sections. And while I'm talking about the GRE, someone did ask about the new shortened GRE. Will Case Western Reserve accept the new shortened GRE coming out of, in September 2023 20, for the next cycle if applicants need to reapply or apply? I guess I just said should be the case too. Should we take this new GRE for the next cycle or will old GRE scores still be accepted? And that's a great question because that's obviously gonna affect a lot of people. So the standard answer for that is on September 22, 2023, the GRE general test will be shortened from just under four hours to just under two and will report scores faster. We will accept the current and the shorter GRE as long as the GRE is taken within three years of the application. And the last thing on, I think it's the last thing, on the admissions pages uh, is about the CASPER exam. Um, sometimes people will ask what, how to register. I can't find the registration. It's on our page. It, it's the specific one that's on there. It's the um, CSP 10101 code. And there is a practice test 
and there are lots of CASPER dates, as you can see if you are following along with me all at various different times. So there are plenty. Make sure you get those in um, before the application is um, complete, or the deadline, I should say. Shadowing, shadowing requirements. Um, we ask that you shadow, preferably an anesthesiologist assistant. If you can't, try to shadow another anesthesia provider. There is a shadowing form on our admission requirements page, links to a PDF. I've seen lots of those. I, I know it's working, so it's new this year. We created one and I've seen them a lot in applications now. So thank all of you for that. Um, if you don't have anyone that is near you, you, you want to find somebody try to find somebody who is an anesthesia provider. Um, maybe if you're local to one of our sites, call that site. Each one of our sites has specific detailed information on our website as well. There's four tabs on there for Cleveland, Houston, Austin, and Washington, DC with contact information. So you wanna give them a call because they know their clinical uh, people a little bit better. And then it goes through physical and technical requirements for um, a, a person in the program. And then a little bit more information on there. All right, Logan, I need a little bit of a break. Do you wanna <laughs> answer some questions? Nice. nice job, Teresa. This is Ty. I will uh, jump in on some of those questions as well, if you don't mind, give a little bit of a breather. Um, there were a couple in regards to um, the letters of recommendation, as, and there was a few more also that were submitted based on, um, uh, you know, what are we looking for? What, what does an application need in order to set it apart? And the way I like to approach that is I want you as an applicant to tell me what lights you up, what makes you different. Um, if there, and, and that can be anything. If you are a huge fan of basket weaving, explain to me, share with me why and how that lights you up. Not everybody's gonna have that. And I don't want everyone to have the same uh, answer same approach when we're evaluating the applications as they're coming in. Each one of these applications, your personal statements, your reference letters, as well as your test scores and GPAs and all those are all looked at um, by everyone that's going to be interviewing you um, in order to give us a little background. And then when we get to the interview process, that's an opportunity for us to be able to visit with you one-on-one -on -one, uh, to dive a little bit deeper into the things that you've shared with us. So if you want to know how to strengthen your application on the narrative side of things, my, my uh, suggestion to you is just to focus on what, what excites you or what sets you apart, um, however that might be. Um, um, Ty, we do have a couple questions about the interview process. Can you walk us through um, if somebody applies to all four locations, are they getting an interview with all four? Um, a, a little bit more detail about the interview process. Absolutely. So you'll be interviewed if selected for an interview. It will be at your first um, first location preference. Um, the interview team at that location will conduct the interview. And then after every interview, each site does it very similar in that we, we come together collectively as an interview committee and evaluate that applicant. Um, we have rubrics and metrics that we're looking at to kind of give us, to, so that we're all kind of talking uh, the same apples, uh, no matter which program it is. And then um, if for some reason you are not granted admission into that first location uh, if your application is is deemed pretty strong um, and even if you didn't get into that first selection then the second salute second location that you selected um, 
and down the line would have the opportunity to review our notes, um, our comments that we made. Each one of the interviewers is gonna be um, putting comments on each one of the applicants that we interview. And then also we talk um, across programs to kind of share ideas on how those interviews went and uh, possibly um, an opportunity to maybe visit one-on-one -on -one with one of the uh, program directors or one of the representatives from one of the other programs. So um, the, in a nutshell, the, the interview will be conducted uh, at your first location and then we can share that information if, um, if need be with the other ones. Great, and then we have a couple of questions regarding um, how to find um, individuals to write recommendation letters, for example, for a non, maybe a career changer um, or a non yeah. student. Um, if they're not necessarily in the science field, um, what would you suggest? Thank you for pointing that out, Logan. I actually saw those and wanted to touch on those. That's a great question. And we often have individuals that might come from a non-science background. What we're looking for when we're reviewing those letters of recommendation is depth of knowledge uh, of you. Um, we really want to be able to hear from someone who understands you and knows you. Um, and that doesn't necessarily have to be your college professor. Um, maybe you uh, have a good uh, close bond with, um, with a supervisor or um, someone outside of the academic arena. So if you were coming in, let's say that you were a uh, accountant and you're going back to school in order to, uh, you're applying to our program, then absolutely, I am I will take a letter of reference from, uh, from another accountant, from a supervisor that can share with me a little bit about what sets you apart from all those around you. Um, whether it's your, your work ethic, your drive, um, your uh, ability to communicate, your leadership skills. Um, I don't need someone to just tell me this student did really well in my class. I can see you did really well in your science classes based on your GPA. Um, what I'm looking for is something a little bit more, more real, of more substance uh, as, a, as a better indicator of, of who you are as an individual. What we're looking for as program directors is putting together a team of students um, that can come together in a classroom uh, and uh, collaborate and work together to get through the program and ultimately to be a, an outstanding provider in the operating room. And to do that, it takes more than just science. It's going to take an ability to communicate, um, to work within the anesthesia care team, as well as the, the academic prowls, if you will, to understand the material and to be able to talk about the, the science and theories behind anesthesia delivery. So really it all comes down to being able to market yourself as a well-rounded, well-versed individual with letters of recommendation that can substantiate that to us. Great, thanks time. Teresa, are you ready? Yeah, I have some um, questions that were submitted early on, and I want to hit those. I know there's a lot of questions. I answered some of those in the Q&A, um, but obviously we probably won't be able to get to all of those. Um, someone asked, if one is planning on applying to regular admission, do I need to wait for a certain date to submit my application, or can I go ahead and submit my application as early as possible without the worry of my application getting mixed with the early decision? Um, as I said earlier, once you apply, you are in. Um, we don't separate the early decision from the um, late decision. Um, the big difference is we will review those early decision applications more quickly. Um, if I don't ex get accepted with early one October decision, can I reapply for regular February? Again, once you apply, you're in. You don't need to reapply. Um, someone asked this, and I just answered it in the Q&A. Can I apply if I'm getting my bachelor's degree in May 2024? And the answer is yes. Um, again, just like the prerequisites, you have to have your um, undergraduate degree 
by the start of our program, which is in next May. Is it fine to take a required prerequisite course after submitting the application? And the answer to that is yes, you do not need to have all your prerequisites complete prior to applying. This was a really good question and our program director and I kind of laughed at this, chuckled at it. Uh, what are some things the admissions office does not want to see in student applications? And Ty, I think he mentioned a little bit about this, um, but initially, once we do those initial reviews, what we don't want to see are repurposed letters of recommendation. Uh, every once in a while, we'll see letters of recommendation for med school or for PA school, and they do get flagged. Um, there is a note that's put in your file that states that. So just be really cautious with your evaluators who you choose and be specific um, so they know who they're writing to. Make sure that the recommendations are written specifically for our program. Um, sometimes we get applications that, you know, for example, mention applying to Nova or something like that. And, and you know, that's a little bit of a ding. Um, we want to know more about you. So make sure that you're sincere and, and truthful in your application and don't pat it just to put things in there. For example, some people put down, put um, um, you know, grants that they'll get or loans that they get in undergrad. And that's not necessary. Um, tips for personal statement. Um, I think Ty kind of already touched on that. Just describe how your personal and professional background will help you achieve your career goals and suit you for the profession. Uh, use your own words and just for ease of reading, just use paragraphs. Make sure you proofread it. Have someone else look at it as well. Another question is, is having a job related to anesthesia, for example, surge tech, anesthesia tech, helpful for having a strong application and can that possibly help balance out other aspects of my application, such as the GPA or in the GRE score? Um, we do a holistic review of the application. So we definitely wanna see your clinical or medical experience and it's very helpful. And whether or not it's enough to outweigh any other weak areas of your application, we can't really say. Um, one of our, uh, CAAs with our program now who sits in Cleveland and also Austin um, likes to use this quote, no one thing will get you into the program and no one thing will keep you out of the program. So again, just be yourself, explain how you will best fit in the program and how it will meet, meet your career goals. Um, you're competing with a very big applicant pool this year. Um, we have more than twice the applications at this time than we did last year. So be yourself, put your best foot forward. Um, someone asked, and I saw this in some of the questions too, how do you weigh post-baccalaureate work in regards to applying? We do realize that some applicants will enroll in a post-bac program in order to boost their GPA and increase their chances to get into an AA program. And that's good because it can show that a student can handle graduate level work. And along those lines, we also recommend working to eliminate any C grades in your prerequisites. And both of those can make you a more competitive applicant. Okay, Logan, that's it for my questions, I believe. Okay, um, I'm gonna turn this one over to Ty. Um, we have a couple uh, prospective students asking if you could outline um, first year versus second year. Absolutely. So as I had touched on a little bit earlier, the first year, the first 12 months, I consider your didactic year, uh, and it is going to be about 70 to 80% focused on didactic coursework. Um, but if we break the three semesters down, the summer semester, Half of that we affectionately refer to as our indoctrination or boot camp phase. And that's going to be the first five to six weeks of the program where we're really coming at you from all three angles. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, kind of an immersion into anesthesia. Before I can put you in the operating room, I need to make sure that you've got some basic information 
under your belt so that you can have articulate conversations once we get you into the operating room. Um, so we're going to provide you some information before you ever begin the program so you can come in ready to hit the ground running from day one. It's going to be pretty hard and pretty fast for the first uh, month or so, um, focusing on the didactic side of things with uh, some beginning uh, simulation, if you will, um, becoming familiar with the equipment, airway management. Uh, this is week four, and we're going to be working on IV skills and placements this week um, already. So, um, and then we'll get you into the operating room. The second and third semester, the fall and spring semesters, traditional, a little bit longer in length, obviously, than the summer semester. Uh, you will spend about 70% of your time working uh, in the operating, or excuse me, in the classroom on the didactic side, understanding the sciences, the theories, the pharmacology, physiology, um, aspects of anesthesia delivery. You'll be getting more in depth in simulation. Uh, all the way to, uh, I know that at the end of the second semester, that final is going to involve uh, you uh, running a case, a simulated case uh, by Christmas. Uh, the other 30% of the time during your first year, you are going to be in clinicals uh, about two days a week. Uh, we're trying to work on a total of about 16 hours per week. We'll be in the operating room, you'll be working uh, under the direction of a certified anesthesiologist assistant working within the anesthesia care team, observing and working on patient care as well as your communication skills, um, understanding the various uh, aspects of providing an anesthesia, just a general anesthesia with simple monitors, uh, somewhat healthy patients. Um, and as you are able to um, do more in the operating room your first year, your preceptors are going to be giving you increased responsibility. So that by the time you're finishing up uh, your first year, the whole the class as a whole should be able to tackle a, an, uh, a relatively healthy basic anesthetic care plan uh, with a relatively healthy individual with minimal input from their preceptors. And that's at the end of the first year. The second year is going to be your clinical, clinical phase. And during that time, the students are going to spend one month in the various uh, specialties of anesthesia. So you will spend a month focusing on cardiothoracic anesthesia, OB anesthesia, neuroanesthesia, pediatric anesthesia, um, outpatient surgery, as well as a couple months doing general anesthesia. And during those months of general anesthesia, you still might be doing pediatrics, you might be doing neuro, you might be doing uh, obstetrics. It's just going to be whatever comes in uh, through your operating room. And then you'll still be spending some time as a class doing case presentations um, and working together as we get you through the clinical comprehensive exams, ultimately uh, preparing you for your certification exam upon graduation. So that kind of quickly breaks down the difference between the two different uh, two different years. Awesome, thanks so much. Sorry, I was jumping on here and answering some nope. questions that I could. Um, let's see. Um, can you talk a little bit? I there were a few questions about shadowing. Um, I just as a whole, can you tell the group? Um, how many shadows are shadowing hours are strongly recommended? As Teresa had mentioned, we we definitely recommend shadowing with a certified anesthesiologist assistant. If there's not one in your area, definitely make sure you're connecting with an anesthesia provider, whether it's an anesthesiologist um, or possibly a nurse anesthetist. We would like to have at least eight hours of shadowing. More is always better. Uh, the more time you spend in the operating room and, vis and, and spend visiting with those professionals, the better you're going to understand what it is you're wanting to train to do for a living. Uh, there's a lot of information out there for students, whether it's um, uh, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Google searches on what being an anesthesiologist assistant is all about, but really the best way to understand what it is we do is to see it firsthand in the operating room 
and, and understand what that means to work within the anesthesia care team, what that communication flow looks like, how we actually take care of patients and understand the sights, the smells and, and the flow of what goes on. So the more time you can spend in the operating room, the better. And for those of you that, um, that aren't close to one of the uh, MSA training facilities, um, just reach out to, and find out if there are um, hospitals in your area that either employ AAs or just reach out to, to someone within the anesthesia department. Uh, if you are fairly close or going to be visiting one of the, um, one of the locations that has a, a, an AA training program, you can always reach out to that school to ask them if they have um, any points of contact at the various at the local hospitals that might be able to uh, to provide some shadowing opportunities. Awesome, thank you, Teresa and Ty, for the information tonight. Um, we are almost um, to the six o'clock hour, so I wanted to give some more information. And in the event that we didn't answer your question, um, please email us at msaprogram.case.edu. Um, or as Teresa mentioned, we really try to keep our website up to date. So there's a lot of information on our website. Uh, please visit it, take a look. Um, and if you don't find what you're looking for, um, please reach out to us. And then also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. The handle is CWRU MSA Program. And then another item, um, upcoming virtual events, we will have one on August 16th, um, Journey to a Certified Anesthesiologist Assistant. This will go in depth into the profession as well as our program. Um, all four locations, we'll talk about each. And then um, Day in the Life of a Case Western MSA student. Um, this will be happening on August 22. This will be led by uh, current students, our student leaders. Um, they'll give you the inside scoop of what it's like to be an MSA student at Case Western Reserve University. And then um, our webinar on September 13th, uh, Tips for a Strong Application and in Interview. All right. Thank you all uh, for listening tonight. Like I said, please reach out to us if you have um, any more questions. Thanks.